Good afternoon. It's 2.20 Thursday, March 26th. This is the TDN Writers' Room presented by Keeneland. I am Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. I'm Bill Finley, and I'm responsible for all the TDN's Fauner Park coverage. Jonathan Green, General Manager from DJ Stable, and you guys will be pleased to know that you were my one call today. All right, so we'll get started this week, uh, I guess, with the most read story on the TDN this week, and, and probably one of the most read stories of the year thus far. Uh, Brad Weisbord of BSW slash Crow Bloodstock wrote a letter to the editor for us in which he revealed that he had contracted the coronavirus in the past couple of weeks. Um, he had to leave his uh, wife and little kid and go to an apartment by himself and basically isolate himself there for eight days. And it's a it's a hellish account of, of what he went through. He said he wanted to die for a couple of days there, and he appears to be on the mend now. So so we're happy about that. But I think it's just the reason it, it blew up so much on our site is that, you know, it really hits home and it, it, it drives home that, you know, nobody, nobody is immune to this. Nobody rich or poor, you know, young or, young or old, everybody can get this. And uh, I mean, obviously, the, the the severity of cases changes from person to person, but I think it's it's key for people to understand that you know this is this is something that can happen to you, especially considering there aren't really nationwide guidelines right now of what people should be doing. I mean, here in the New York area, we're on basically total lockdown, but uh, I, I've seen in Florida they're basically going on as with life as as normal, having pool parties and stuff. So. I think it is important for people all across the country and across the globe to understand that uh, this this can happen to you, and and you have to be careful and take precautions. And you know, tying into that, we just had the breaking news earlier via Bill of uh, Javier Castellano, who has also tested positive for the coronavirus. It sounds like his symptoms he's asymptomatic, so his ordeal has, has been much uh, less taxing than Brad's, but he's had to be on the sideline for a little bit. So yeah, just people need to realize that this is this is something that a affects people across the spectrum. Yeah, Joe, what we learned from Brad is first and foremost and firsthand how harrowing this can be. And, you know, it was just like you, he took you on this voyage of just through hell. And he's someone who is young and healthy and is going to be fine. You know, imagine what it'd be like for people who aren't going to turn out that way. So really glad that he's okay. And, you know, it was good that he shared his story. You know, we're all saying the same things, you know, people have to be smart. And, you know, maybe if some knucklehead out there was doing something wrong, like you said, these pool parties and whatnot, and read this from Brad, they would say, you know, geez, I, I can't do this. But, you know, I was would have said yesterday that how remarkable it was that really you look all throughout horse racing and you have a very hard time finding, besides Brad, anybody else that's been afflicted by this. But you knew that couldn't hold up. And then, lo and behold, earlier today on Thursday, comes out that Javier Castellano has it. Again, from what we know, it doesn't look like it's too bad. And the good news is that they are not going to close down Gulfstream. Uh, Bill Badgett, the uh, new head of operations at Gulfstream, matter of fact, the old head of operations and now back, said that Castellano had not been at Gulfstream since March 15th. He definitely got the coronavirus afterwards has not circulated with any jockeys in the meantime. He says he's not part of the Gulfstream community over the time period where he would have got the virus, so therefore we don't see a need to cancel racing. And, uh, you know, some people will say that's crazy. Um, I say it's great that racing's going to go on, and we'll just knock on wood. Kudos to Gulfstream Park for doing everything they can in order to, um, you know, just push back the, uh, the, the the wave of coronavirus that's going on throughout the uh, the world right now. Um, they're following the CDC protocols to the letter. Um, I know that they've limited the number of people that, that are allowed to come to the track, allowed to come to the backstretch, and even so much as, you know, when you go through security to go into the barn area, they're actually taking your temperature and um, and letting you know exactly what the situation there is as well. So kudos to all of them. I did hear a rumor um, that Luis Saez uh, was the one who started the uh, the investigation on uh, Javier Castellano as far as, uh, you know, having the coronavirus. And I noticed that Saez is picking up a lot of his mounts. So, you know, is it is that a true, you know, rumor or not? I'm not so sure. But, um, you know, thankfully, it seems like that most of the racing community, if not all, has been immune from uh, from this virus, and uh, we wish speedy recovery to uh, to Javier and and uh, and hopefully uh, you know anyone else that that's come in contact with with this uh, just you know difficult situation and virus. 
Today's news is sponsored by West Point Thoroughbreds. Owning a multiple grade stakes winning racehorse like Hard Not to Love is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and chances for a big horse. Check out why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standing in racing partnerships. Visit our website, westpointtb.com. A couple of interesting horses this weekend for West Point. We mentioned him last week, but a decorated invader who won the grade one summer stakes last year at Woodbine and had a pretty miserable trip in the British Cup Juvenile Turf. It's going to make his three-year-old debut in the Cutler Bay Stakes with Joel Rosario riding for the first time Saturday at, at Gulfstream. And also at Gulfstream, they're going to have Focus Group, uh, who is a, a, a multiple graded stakes winner. He's going to look to win the grade two Pan American for the second year in a row. He's It's his first run in the Clement Barn because he was sold another sponsor plug, but he was sold at Keeneland November at the racehorse section and uh, used to be trained by Chad Brown. So he's going to go out for Christoph Clement and West Point uh, Saturday at Gulfstream. So they got a lot of action there as well. Yeah, you know, I actually ran against Decorated Invader a couple of times last year during his uh, his campaign through the summer stake at, at Woodbine and also in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf. And, uh, you know, it's nice to see that horse making his three-year-old debut, uh, albeit a full field, tough race, um, I think tougher than they expected for a $100,000 stake at a non-graded stake at Gulfstream Park. But it's great to see those horses come back and do, you know, and, and, and looks like he's going to be one of the favorites in the race. Incidentally, uh, an old high school buddy of mine actually his dad owns a piece of Decorated Invader. Um, so it, it, from a personal note, it, it was uh, also exciting to be able to watch that horse uh, campaign last year and uh, wish him the best of luck uh, during his three-year-old campaign. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. It's a good time to run down where we are in terms of tracks open and closed. Uh, this week, we lost uh, Turfway in Charlestown, both closed. Aqueduct, which previously suspended racing last Friday after they had a backstretch worker test positive, uh, announced yesterday that they're going to be suspending racing at least through April 5th. So that's unfortunate for them because April 4th was the big Wood Memorial card that also had the, uh, the Carter and the Gazelle and a bunch of really good races, really marquee day. That and Cigar Mile Day are the two marquee days for an aqueduct uh, throughout the year. So that's unfortunate, but it seems like they're, they're trying to take all the right precautions. I, I wonder if that means that we really won't see racing in New York until Belmont opens. Belmont scheduled to open at the end of April. Uh, I mean, Aqueduct had a couple of weeks left, I believe, after the Wood Memorial. I wonder if they'll just spike the rest of that. Um, I, I also wonder, and we got, we've got we talked about this before, you know, whether or not there's going to be fits and starts of racing uh, throughout the year now, because I, as I said, I think New York is taking this a lot more seriously than, than certain areas, and then rightfully so, because we're the, we're the epicenter right now for this thing. And, you know, I, I think that there are some early indications that the social distancing and people being on lockdown is starting to have a little bit of a positive effect. Obviously, it's still super early and there's not a ton of data on that, but it seems like the curve is starting to bend a little bit the other way. And like I said, there are so many other places that aren't practicing these protocols. And I wonder if maybe in a month or so or a month and a half, New York is going to be back up and running, but then Kentucky won't be running or Florida won't be running or, you know, California won't be running or any other place that you would consider shipping a horse from New York, maybe Delaware. Uh, I wonder if that they're going to have the same problem that we're having right now, just a little bit later on in the calendar. And uh, that, that could make things tricky, but you know, obviously the main thing is, is for the, uh, the state of New York to really lock down everything and get this thing moving in the other direction. But it's, it's just an interesting implication for the rest of the calendar. What's going to happen if these other places pop up as hotspots later on in the year. Well, Joe, that's part of the, you know, the conundrum of this. Nobody knows. I mean, everybody is just, we're doing the best we can, but it's all guessing because nobody's ever seen anything like this. We don't know if this is going to last another three weeks or three months or 10 weeks or 10 months. Let's hope it is on the shorter side of all those numbers I've just thrown out there. 
How about making the Wood Memorial being run at Belmont the first week because people are going to need derby prep races and places for three-year-olds to race? You, you know, there's so many things like that that we just have no idea. We already discussed where the heck they're going to put the Travers. Can't be run a week before the Kentucky Derby, the September 5th Kentucky Derby. So, you know, it's uncharted territory and, you know, everybody is just trying to do the best they can. You know, let's, I agree with you. You see some of these reports now, at least yesterday. And you know what? I, I don't like to get political on this thing because this is not a place for it. But has Andrew Cuomo been a star or what in this thing? You know, maybe people in, in Kentucky or people around the world aren't uh, tuning into him. But because we're here in the Northeast and New York City is, is the epicenter of this right now. He's on TV constantly. And boy, is he on the ball and reassuring and everything. And, you know, really lets you know that what leadership is all about. And in you know, just the last uh, 24 hours or so, he seems to, you know, seen a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. But you know what? Once again, we're just guessing. I, I, I loved his uh, his sound bites the other day, uh, Cuomo, about uh, you're giving me, you know, 400. FEMA's giving me 400 uh, machines. You go tell the other 29,400 people or 29,600 people who's not getting them. And I was like, wow, it's only it's, it's too bad that that he couldn't be the New Yorker to be the, the right in candidate, uh, you know, for the Democratic uh, you know, uh, election. But but anyway, we, you're right. We digress into politics, which, which we try not to get into on, on, on this show for sure. But, you know, it, it would be nice if. New York, um, you know, would be able to race at Belmont. I just heard another rumor, unsubstantiated rumor, but this one w was a legitimate rumor, um, that uh, they may not even run at Belmont at all, and they may try to extend Saratoga for uh, for two weeks early in order to get some of these big races that are being um, postponed currently at the at the aqueduct meet to go into Saratoga to try to allow them to be prepped. But everything is topsy turvy, as as Joe likes to say. It's fluid, um, and until we start to get an idea of what we can do as individuals, you know, from a working standpoint, we're not going to know exactly when the calendar officially starts and 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 when it ends in in, in racing. Um, there was a uh, another, you know, story out there that Keeneland was actually going to um, try to move their race meet to coincide with the sales, um, which, you know, you can you can make an argument on, on both sides um, as far as how that would go logistically. Uh, personally, I like to keep them separate uh, just because the racing, I think, is is one aspect of, of, of the business that Keeneland excels in and the sales they also uh, excel in as well. But it's almost two different audiences for the racing and for the, uh, for the yearling sales. Yeah. And I think um, it's, 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 that kind of leads into uh, what, what is the main problem, potential problem here for the horse population. I think that there is a, a major potential here for horses, especially if the economy continues to, to, to slide down, I think that there's a big potential issue of horses getting kind of lost in the shuffle if owners are, are forced to sell off their stables or forced to disperse their stock, especially at some of these lower level tracks where they have like at Finer Park 2,500 claimers. Um, I just I, I worry about what what we can do to stem that tide, because I think especially if the if the economy keeps going down and the the, the coronavirus situation gets worse. I just think there's it's going to be, and it's going to be hard for people to see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of having races to plan for. I think that most most owners can stick it out a little bit if they have a goal in mind for the horse or in most trainers as well. But I think when it's so up in the air and there's there's so much it's so murky when the next big race is going to be, I think that's a situation where you could have a lot of horses being sold off to maybe some questionable characters and, you know, worst case scenario, they end up in a slaughter pen. And I just think that's something that we have to guard against now. And I think, you know, the people at the top of the game really, really have, have an obligation here. And, you know, people, the people with all the capital and, and, you know, all the big horses, I think they have to have an obligation to make sure that these smaller stables and these smaller owners can be made whole as best as possible, whether that's, you know, making donations to the Thoroughbred Retirement Foundation and all the all the rehoming and aftercare places, um, whether that's, you know, cutting checks to, to horsemen's associations or giving owners breeding discounts or letting people have their horses lay up for no charge or little charge. I think that, you know, the the 
key players, the big players at the very top of the pyramid in this sport have a responsibility to make sure that this isn't a time where we lose horses in the shuffle and, you know, lose a lot of horsemen as well, because I think, you know, similarly to how small business is being affected way larger than big business at this time with the crisis, I think that's going to be, it's going to be a microcosm of that in racing where small trainers and small stables that are already scraping to get by, you know, are going to have even more issues. And eventually these horses are going to have to go somewhere else. So I, I think it's on the people who have the very, very, the most resources to make sure that the rest of the game doesn't fall away because we're already losing participants seemingly by the day. Joe, this could become a big problem. Now, first of all, no horse in the Chad Brown barn has anything to worry about. No horse in the Bob Baffert barn has anything to worry about. No horse owned by uh, John Green and his family has anything to worry about for a couple reasons. All these horses are valuable and the people I just mentioned are very decent people. But you look at the horses, like I wrote about earlier in the week at Fawner Park, running in $2,500 claimers with a purse of $4,000. And at th- with that kind of money coming in, I don't know how these guys put food on the table or feed their horses as it is. I mean, that must be incredibly difficult. But and not just Fawner, Mountaineer, your favorite track, Joe, Charlestown, Penn National, these kind of places. You know, a lot of horses there on their best days aren't worth two or $3,000, but they eat as much food and hay as, as, as bricks and mortar does, did last year. And somebody's got to pay for that and somebody's got to take care of them. You got to imagine the trainers are going to go broke. They're not going to have any money to take care of their horses. And the only way that they may be able to recoup some money or the owners is to go out and sell their horses. Now, that may mean selling them to another trainer who can find a way to make things work, but it also unfortunately could mean selling them to the slaughterhouse. And look, I don't condone it. I, I think it's repulsive that people do this. But if you if a guy says, look, I, I'm, I can't feed my family and this horse is eating me out of uh, house and home and I can get $600 by selling it in the slaughterhouse, you know what? Again, it's awful but you can see how people would think that way. If this thing goes on for four or five weeks, everything will be fine. If it goes on for four or five months, Joe, you're absolutely on top of this. I don't know exactly what racing can do about it other than some very nice rich people, you know, upping their contributions to the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance and the TRF and that sort of thing. But that is one of the scary parts of this episode in our lives and our history of horse racing that right now has sort of been swept under the rug. Yeah, and as an owner in the business, it, it, it's it's a very difficult situation because when we buy horses or we breed horses, we're doing it based on uh, an assumed value. And, and basically you're saying we're hoping that the horse is going to be able to turn out to be worth more than our initial investment or earn more than, than its you know, monthly or quarterly expenses. Um, there are horses that we don't buy or breed to stallions we don't breed to um, because there's just no, it'd be almost impossible for that progeny to be able to get up over into the black um, based on that equation. So, you know, we have a responsibility to the horses that we produce and that we buy. Um, but to say that the owners at the top end of the industry need to, to, you know, take care of horses. And this is a little controversial and a little, a little cold, I think, uh, that I'm going to talk about. But I don't think it's the West's responsibility or the Dub's responsibility to pay for $2,500 claimers at a small racetrack when they don't want anything to do with those horses in the first place. It's not their responsibility to take care of them because they were never involved in those horses. Um, however, if you said to me, yeah, but John, don't you think that when you buy a horse at public auction, regardless of who it is, um, that a percentage of it should go towards an aftercare program? Absolutely. And then I'm all in favor for that. But I don't want the business to turn into socialism where, you know, we're all in it together and, you know, we want we want to you know, hold hands and, and sing Kumbaya because at the end of the day, it's a competitive industry and that's why we do it because we want our horse with, you know, the jockey with our silks to be in the winner's circle on our horse. And, you know, the other horses, those owners have to take care of them. If it turns out like Bill's example that somebody can't feed their family or make their mortgage, then of course, you know, those horses should go into some kind of an aftercare program that should be funded by the industry. Um, but I, I wouldn't say that, that it falls on the responsibility of a handful of owners at the top of the game to take care of the, you know, the, the unwanted horses that they never had any responsibility for, never involved with them. Um, beforehand. But if you said to me, yeah, they should be, you know, we should, we should set up some kind of a system 
that funds aftercare, I'm a thousand percent behind that. I just think it's it's the kind of thing where there's there's such a small percentage of people already that make money in this business and we're losing trainers and owners all the time and losing participants in the sport that I think it's it behooves everyone to have some kind of skin in the game and protecting all the animals. And yeah, it's like logistically, it's not super it's it's not easy to to figure out, you know, who to donate to or 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 uh, you know, what horses to, to pick up. But I just think in general, there has to be an effort, um, mostly on behalf of the people, by, by the people that can afford it most to make sure that horses aren't lost in the shuffle. And and I think that, you know, sometimes there are handshake agreements when a horse gets claimed off of another trainer or owner and the original trainer or owner will say like, look, if this horse needs a home, you can, you can bring them back to me and we'll find them a home. I think that kind of thing needs to be, written in to contracts in racing and in sales all around it can't just be um okay we're gonna we're gonna wait to see if this horse is worth anything for the new connections and if he's not maybe hopefully they'll they'll return him to us i just i think especially in in tough times like this like there are horses you know the the lower level claimers keep the game churning just as much as the grade one horses. You know, without the lower levels, I don't think racing could survive. I mean, we've talked in the past about eliminating the claiming game, but I'm not I'm not in favor of that. I think there should be more restrictions on it. But you know, you need these lower level horses to fill races and keep the game moving, keep the wheels turning turning. So yeah, I mean, I understand that it's not particularly the the Gary West of the world responsibility to take care of the twenty five hundred dollar claimers at Funner, but like I said, there's a, there's a, a number of other ways that you can help out. Whether it's lay, letting horses lay up on your farm, um, I, I just think you know we we kind of all have skin in the game here to make sure that in tough times like this, horses don't disappear off the face of the map because they all have value. Yeah, absolutely, Joe. I think I think we're we're trying to get to the same answer. Um, and, and trying to figure out the mechanism of how to fund it is, is really the, uh, you know, the, the end game with, with all this. But it, it, there, there's statistics that come out all the time about horses that go through public auction. And I think the number was like 90% of all horses that go through public auction um, are worth, more, worth the most the day they sell than the day after they're done racing. Um, so if you it basically, if you put in some kind of a, I'm calling it a tax or a tariff um, on buying a horse, then you're going to raise more money than um, necessarily trying to get people to donate to a cause, uh, you know, afterwards. The, the excitement and the euphoria is, is buying a horse um, for, for most people. It's unfortunately not campaigning that horse because a lot of them don't get to that, those heights again. So it, there's definitely a way to, to do it. Um, and I think as an industry, we're coming together on so many different fronts for so many different problems that this would be another one that we should add to the list um, that, need to be, that needs to be recognized because the last thing we want are any of, the, any of our athletes to end up in a slaughterhouse or, or not cared for to the, to the best of anyone's ability simply because they were forgotten about or because they, they ran last in a $2,500 claiming race. And I think the main, the main thing that you can do and everybody can do is to donate to aftercare organizations because, you know, they're the ones that I think are going to be getting most of the calls. I think most people do try to do the right thing, but, you know, there's only so many stalls available and, you know, hopefully with donations, they can expand a little bit and, and accept more horses because there's going to be needs. There's going to be needs for stalls, especially if the economy keeps sinking the way it is. And it's just, it's an unfortunate reality of the game. And I think we just, we all have to do our best to make sure that the horses, the people who have really no say in participating in this game need to be taken care of first and foremost. In some sort of odd way too, I feel that horse players have an obligation to at least these two tracks, Will Rogers and Fonner Park. And because, you know, these guys are out there trying to make the thing work and get enough handle in there so it makes sense. And, you know, look, we all want to bet on Gulfstream. We all want to bet on San Diego. We all want to bet on Saratoga. But, you know, what? In, 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 you can only say that in these times, you put $200 through the windows on Monday or Tuesday at, at Fonner Park, you are absolutely helping that racetrack stay in business. And by their staying in business, you're keeping – these horses fed, you're putting some po- money in the pockets of these trainers, and we're keeping the horses away from, you know, an ending to their lives that we don't even want to think about. That's a good point. Yeah, I, I think that's also something that we can do, and you can make a bigger difference uh, better putting money into the pools at those smaller tracks than, than at the larger tracks. I, I will say that 
Uh, I don't usually bet Santa Anita that much, but I did, I did support them last week just because, you know, I appreciated that the, the statement that they put out of why they were continuing to race, which was basically like, it wasn't, it wasn't wishy-washy. It wasn't apologetic. It was more, look, these horses need to be taken care of. This is essential to our business. And these horses have 24 hour needs almost. And we have people that live with them that, the horses trust them, and these are these are these are the people that we need to keep around. And and I just I appreciated that, you know, in in a in a state where there's a lot a lot of pressure on them, I appreciate their kind of unapologetic look. Like we have to take care of these horses. Um, we're we're going to keep on racing as long as it's safe to do so. So, you know, it's we're we're thankful for the tracks that that are are continuing to run, but you know, it's obviously a lot of pressure, and, and everything's fluid at the moment. Yeah, you know, Joe, we're going to hear from Craig Fravel, uh, an interview I conducted yesterday as a Green Group guest of the week. He, of course, is the chief executive officer of the racing string of the Stronach Group. And uh, I brought up some of that with them. But, you know, the Stronach Group over the years gets a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of criticism. And some of it deserved, some of it not deserved. But, you know, they have been a beacon of light and hope through this thing. They've kept they have four thoroughbred racetracks that would be operating now. They've kept three of them open. The only reason Laurel's not open is because the governor of, of uh, Maryland, Larry Hogan, said, no, you can't do it. But, you know, I'm sure they had to work the things behind the scenes with various government officials and whatnot. And then, you know, just to show that they're not full of it and that they're just trying to make a lot of money right now, thinking that, you know, if Gulfstream doesn't have competition from Aqueduct and, and pretty soon Keeneland, et, et cetera, you know, how much the handle will be. Well, they've said they're going to donate whatever profits they they make through this time period to charity. So those of you people out there that have been, you know, Stronach group knockers or haters, um, you got to rethink your, your position there. They, I mean, without those three racetracks right now, you think we're in bad shape now. Imagine if there's no Gulfstream or Santa Anita. My goodness. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With more than 500 clients in the horse business, they were bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. With Gulfstream and Santa Anita, two of the only tracks remaining open, Bill Finley spoke with the Stronic Group CEO, Craig Fravel, last night. Here's his interview. We're joined now by the Green Group guest of the week, Craig Fravel, who is the chief executive racing of racing operations for the Stronic Group. And Craig, thanks for joining us at this uh, time where you must be very busy and things going crazy. First of all, um, let's go over some news that was made yesterday. And the, there's a report in the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel that the mayor of Hallandale Beach was making noise about Gulfstream needed to close because it wasn't an order uh, com uh, complying with the order of the Broward County, uh, which is the county, of course, that Gulfstream is in so far as non-essential business is not operating. Bring us up to speed on that. And is that any sort of threat? Well, look, we take seriously any... Um consternation on the part of elected officials, but um, the fact of the matter is that was the vice mayor of Hallandale Beach. We've since been uh, communicating uh, both with uh, Broward County and, and we'll be corresponding with uh, the mayor's office to make sure that they fully understand what it is we're doing, the precautions we're taking. Um, and uh, one thing I can be very clear about is we never threaten litigation to anyone. I'm not sure where that uh, allegation came from, but we certainly want to work cooperatively with uh, all the various agencies and the jurisdictions we operate. Okay, well, good news there. So as we look at the overall picture for the Stronach Group tracks, and right now you have three running, Golden Gate, Gulfstream, and of course, Santa Anita, you have one not running, Laurel. But as long as this thing stay relatively the same as the way they are, which would be no changes in laws or regulations issued by the governors of California or Florida, uh, no coronavirus outbreaks of any magnitude at the facilities, the track, the backside, et cetera. How long do you think Santa Anita and Gulfstream can continue? Is this something that you guys will continue to race as long as it is humanly possible? The only thing I can tell you about what we've all been through over the last two weeks is that things seem to change on an hourly basis. I think um, I was in Florida a week and a half ago when some of the first governmental orders started coming out and things have changed literally hour by hour, day by day on those things. So I, I can't make 
any long-term predictions uh, any more than anyone else can. Um, we're all learning more about the situation. Um, we're learning how to implement best practices and trying to do those uh, consistently across our properties. We're obviously very concerned uh, for the workers. Uh, no one's being asked to come to work if they don't want to, and we're concerned with their health and safety. So all those things are front of mind. The other thing I would say is that, you know, when you get into the essential business category and essential business activities, um, a racing and a racetrack environment is much different than many, many businesses out there. Um, we have horses that need to be taken care of. Um, they can't simply be left in their stalls 24 hours a day for lengths of time on end. And um, and the fact of the matter is, uh, when we do race, um, it's with a skeletal crew, to say the least. I mean, we have no non-essential personnel. We maintain extraordinary social distancing practices. And our people, to the extent there are people there, but there are very few, they're spread out over expanses of property so that uh, we don't have uh, aggregations of, of people in one place. And we certainly ask them all to stay distant from one another and um, sometimes you have to yell and you know make sure people can be heard but uh, but we're doing I think uh, uh, so many of the best practices that have been suggested by public health experts and um, you know we're going to try to keep this going because if there isn't a revenue stream to support the training of these horses um, then there's going to be a lot more people under the public's care in some sense and I don't think that's good for anyone. Oh, Craig, I want to pick up on what you just said. I, I wanted to save that question for later, but since you mentioned it, now the Stronach Group has already said that it's not going to keep any profits made during this period. They'll be going to charity. And I don't know how profitable maybe running a racing operation is right now without any sort of live uh, revenue so far as admissions and restaurant fees and stuff like that. I, I, we'll save that question for another day. But you just talked about what what most people in racing are talking about when it comes to why we're staying open. And, you know, if you could just continue that, how important is it to the California horsemen, the owners, the trainers, and the backside help, everybody involved to continue to racing? And is that, in fact, the primary reason why the Stronach Group is keeping going at the three tracks? Um, the answer is yes. Um, I think holding the, you know, horses in one place and the people in one place, they're, we're actually operating you know, with our workforce, the, particularly those that take care of the horses directly, um, in a very controlled environment, people's temperatures are being taken on, on a daily basis in and out of the facilities. Um, we're restricting access. There are literally no members of the general public allowed into the backstretch or into the racetrack uh, later in the afternoon if it is operating. And I, I do think keeping uh, horses in training, uh, whether that's modestly exercised or more intensely, is important. Uh, for their well-being, and then also for the well-being of the workers who are, are attendant to them. And that, that's our primary goal and our primary interest is just keeping this ecosystem in place. Uh, Craig, take us back to when the decision was made that racing could stay put at, at um, Santa Anita. Now, California is one of the hardest hit states. It was hit early. And as uh, many governors across the state have been doing, uh, Governor Gavin Newsom, oh, I'm guessing about 10 days ago or so, uh, came forth with the order for this lockdown situation that a lot of us are living in. Uh, we're living that here in, in New Jersey, in the East Coast. And the first inclination was, well, Sandy is not going to be able to race. What happened behind the scenes and what needed to be done to lobby? I don't know if you direct, talked directly to the governor or maybe someone else in his cabinet. But what took place that you got this very positive decision for Santa Anita and for horse racing? And, and how was that pulled off? Well, look, I'm not going to pretend that uh, governors um, and their staffs at this point have huge issues to deal with. Uh, you know, in Governor Newsom's case, 40 million people. Um, so um, it's not like um, I would be going and calling the governor or sitting down and talking to him. We worked through channels with the California Horse Racing Board, um, made the, many of the points I made to you earlier and made sure that we were very carefully articulating our rationale. Um, and, um, you know, that's how we, we, we went about things. To be honest with you, everything, as I said, everything changes day to day and, and things could continue to change. So um, there's no assurance uh, of any sort that that will continue to be the case. But that's where we are right now. And Craig, as you see it, what are the major obstacles uh, standing in the way of, of continuing? Well, I think, you know, the public health officials are constantly asking questions about, you know, what are essential businesses, who should be 
out and about. Um, uh, and if, uh, you know, you have to be able to make them understand your story. And uh, again, I, I don't want to make predictions about um, when and if things could happen. Um, we're just trying to, you know, make sure that we're doing what we're saying we're doing in terms of being responsible, having, you know, really advanced and, and understandable protocols and making sure that people are, and horses are well looked after. Uh, let's switch gears uh, somewhat. It's a coronavirus story, but coming at you from a different angle. Let's go to Maryland now. Craig, the uh, the Triple Crown has been upended by this. All we know at this point is that the Kentucky Derby will be attempted to run on September 5th. We know nothing about the Preakness. We know nothing about the Belmont. Uh, first question, the if things were to stay the same so far as the spacing of the races, that would mean a September 19th Preakness. And um, where is the Stronach Group right now uh, so far as where it might position the Preakness? And is September 19th uh, the leader in the clubhouse, so to speak? Well, you know, Bill, I think uh, when I was at the Breeders' Cup, people always used to ask me what our next host site was going to be. And I used to respond to that question by telling them that as soon as we had something to announce, we would announce it. So um, I think in terms of where the Preakness might end up specifically, uh, you know, those are still internal conversations and analytics going on. Um, and once we've had, you know, the opportunity to really maybe get a better feel for where the course of this, you know, national effort to conquer this virus is going, we'll probably have better answers to those questions. But right now, I can't really uh, address them. Do you think this is something that is imminent or might it this stretch on for a couple of weeks or maybe a month or so? I, don't, I just I don't want to make guesses. Craig, the other major story that's going on in Maryland, I mean, nothing to do with the coronavirus, is the, the good news that the, the, there's $350 million being set aside to rebuild Pimico and to uh, do a major overhaul of Laurel. And it solved a, a real stickling problem about what to do with the pregnancy. I, I realize this still has to be signed by Governor Larry Hogan, but there is no expectation that he will not sign it. And then once he does that, this project can uh, get underway. Uh, first of all, when it happens, is there any sort of timeline so far as what's going to take place and when? Well, we're waiting for the governor's signature. And as I understand that, that could be as long as 50 days from when the, the bill was actually uh, chaptered and, and recorded. So, um, you know, we're still awaiting that major event. Um, and I, I, to be honest with you, I suspect the governor is not particularly focused on signing bills at the moment. He's um, much more concerned about the more immediate crisis, and we certainly understand that. So once that happens and once the governor um, takes the authority uh, within the legislation to appoint the Maryland Stadium Authority as the basic manager of the project. That's when a lot of the details and design work and, and transitioning uh, work will take place uh, with at the lead of the Maryland Stadium Authority. So um, I, I would expect that that work would commence quickly once the governor has signed and then um, actually appointed the stadium authority. But Clearly, it's hard for anybody to do the kind of collaborative work um, that we're used to because we can't meet face to face anymore. So, um, I, again, I, it's one of those things I can't really predict timing wise. And Craig, if Pimico was going to be, you know, start from scratch, torn down, completely rebuilt, can that take place without any interruptions to the Preakness? Might you have a Preakness similar to what they did at, um, you know, at Arlington Park after the place burned down with just tents and that sort of thing? It would seem like it would be difficult to continue with uh, uninterrupted with so much construction going on. Well, that you know, that's one of the transitional subjects that obviously has to be discussed with the stadium authority. Um, I think the uh, plan all along has been for the Preakness to continue. Um, in the city of Baltimore, and that's, you know, a, an integral part of the thought process. So um, I, th I think if people put their minds to things, they can get them done. So we'll, we'll proceed on that assumption. Craig, let me take you back to California. I have one more question. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, there is, if things stay the way they are now and you are continue to race, and of course the Derby is going to be on September 5th, there's going to be a need for prep races for the Derby in spots where there never were prep races before. We've already seen Oaklawn move the 
Arkansas Derby to May 2nd. Any thought given uh, among the Stronach Group, your racing office, or perhaps creating some new three-year-old races that might, you know, be on the calendar in, say, May or June or even July? Uh, well, July wouldn't be pertinent because you don't run them, but at least May and June, that would give the, you know, California horsemen uh, with good three-year-olds uh, other options to run in because there are not going to be many options out there. Um, obviously, looking at lead-in races and preps is a, a large part of the overall question, and, and that's one of the things we'll have on the the drawing board as we um, get to a conclusion on our thinking on the subject. Craig, you, thanks so much for your time. Uh, thank you for the the whole from the entire racing community. Uh, I know you guys. You don't want to. I don't need to pat you on the back, but I will anyways. Uh, that you've done yeoman's work keeping these two racetracks open or three racetracks open, and we all understand how important it is to the industry. So uh, I speak for everybody. I think saying thank you and please keep it up. All right, thank you, Bill. We appreciate it. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As The Green Group Guest of the Week, Craig Fravel will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. The Green Group, bred to save you money. For more information on how they can help you, visit www.greenco.com. So we'll get into the big three-year-old race this Saturday, which is the Curlin Florida Derby at Gulfstream Park, the last of 14 races. Um, on the card as, as Gulfstream prepares to close after this weekend. They were scheduled to close anyway, so it's not because of the coronavirus. But uh, this is going to be one of the last big three-year-old races for a while, probably. We've got the uh, Santa Anita Derby the weekend after that, and then the following weekend is the Arkansas Derby at Oakland. But uh, really nice field, 12 horses plus an AE, uh, four, I think, main contenders. You've got Gouverneur Morris. Um, who is second off the layoff after a pretty nice return at Tampa for Todd Fletcher. And then you got Tiz the Law, obviously probably going to go favored and winner of the Holy Bowl and the Champagne last year. You got Independence Hall, who uh, crushed his competition in Nashua and the Jerome, who was second after chasing a fast pace in the Sam Davis last time. And you've got Etsy in the end, who was a dominant winner of the, of the Fountain of Youth, won by eight and a half lengths, wire to wire. Interestingly enough, he was in the widest outside post in the Fountain of Youth, and now he but again, is in the widest post for the, for, for the Florida Derby through the 12 hole. So I'm guessing it's going to be the similar tactics by Florent Giroux to just hard set and try to clear that traffic from the inside. But there's a lot of speed. There's a lot of speed to his inside, and it's going to be an interesting rider's race in that way. Um, but I would say those four are the main contenders, and, and most sides will be on Tis the Law. What do you guys think? Joe, nothing sexy uh, for me here. Uh, Tis the Law is my pick. He's been my derby pick ever since the Champagne, and I've absolutely seen nothing to uh, get off of him. The Kentucky Jockey Club wasn't a real good race, but he came back with a, such a nice race in the Holy Bull. And you know, if you want to be a wise guy, you know, come up with somebody else. That's fine. He is going to be the favorite, but I, I think it's very clear that you know, east of Baffert Land, he's the best three-year-old in the country right now. Now, so much can change. Maybe he's not as good as, as any one of the big three horses in the Baffert barn. But, you know, he's been just a real, real nice horse from day one. One of the three constitutions in this race, which is another story that's absolutely remarkable. But my thought also is not just about who's going to win this race, but how odd it will be that after it's over, the feeling will be completely different than it was in any other year where it's all about not so much who won this race, but how do they project forward to the Kentucky Derby. And you could almost say that this race has little to any relevance for the Kentucky Derby, just as you would say any race six months out or five and a half months out from another race you know, really can't be considered a prep. You know, the tw of these 12 horses in there, maybe seven of them aren't even racing in September. Uh, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. So it's going to miss that element that always makes these races so cool and, and you make them so interesting. It's a great race, big purse, very good field, but it's really just a horse race, if you know what I mean. Yeah, the the, the 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 bloom is off the rose a little bit on this race. Uh, that you know they lowered the purse by a quarter of a million dollars down to seven fifty, um, and uh, and it just doesn't have the same kind of excitement that uh, one of the last preps, you know, strategically calendar wise, a couple of weeks before the the original date of the Derby. Um, it, Bill, you stole my thunder a little bit by by mentioning the fact that that it's um, you know there's so many progeny of constitution it really should be called the constitution florida derby for all intents and purposes although they didn't sponsor it um with three not only three 
contestants in the race with three major players in the race um, and and all trained by top quality guys. So you would expect that that any one of those three would do well. There are two Curlins in the race, uh, ironically enough, um, and one of them is very likely to be the last horse that Kieran McLaughlin saddles um, in his illustrious training career before he retires to become Luis Saez's um, jockey agent. Ironically enough, uh, Saez is, is riding um, Al Jaweed in, in the race for Shadwell Stable. So I, I really hope that um, that we look back on this race and it does produce the Kentucky Derby winner because it's always great to have uh, you know the Florida Derby Kentucky Derby connection. But my 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 heart is with Kieran's um, horse Alja Weed more so because we've had the, the pleasure of working with Kieran for for a number of years and he is an excellent horse and horseman but he's an even better individual so I hope that that's his sign off um, and the last horse that uh, that he saddles and uh, hopefully he'll be able to be in the winner's circle with uh, with his mount. It would be really cool. He's, it would be his first uh, Florida Derby win so that would be an, an amazing way to go out. Um, just an interesting thing about how the Florida Derby has been such a productive prep for the Kentucky Derby. I mean, I'm just looking at the winners right now. Last year, Maximum Security obviously crossed the wire first in the Derby before getting DQ. Before that, Audible was third in the Derby, always dreaming, went on to win the Derby. Nyquist went on to win the Derby. And 2014 Constitution, Constitution, uh, who has is represented by three Colts in here. Uh, the year before that, Orb went on to win the Derby. I mean, you go right. further back, you got Big Brown and Barbaro. It's really, it's, I don't I don't think there's any other prep race that has had the recent success of the Florida Derby in terms of producing Kentucky Derby winners and Kentucky Derby board hitters. But, you know, it's obviously a, you know, a minor discussion right now in terms of, in terms of what's going on. And it's still a tremendous race. And I think this is, you know, you kind of got to have a feeling of gratitude here uh, with this tremendous card of, of horse racing. And just because we don't know like what, what we're going to see, we don't know if we're going to see any racing a month from now. Um, my guess is there will be a couple tracks still kicking around, but you know, it's not going to be the landscape that we're used to as we have these exciting springs heading into the summer. Um, the hope is that in a couple months we'll be back to normal, but I just think this Saturday, this weekend, maybe the next couple of weeks at Santa Anita and, and Oakland, it's really a time to be thankful for getting to watch these, these really nice three-year-olds go at it and just to get to watch the, uh, the, the great athletic feats of our game, because, you know, we focus a lot on the negative here on this podcast because we're trying to do our part to, you know, shake things up and, and, and get stuff to change. But I think it's, it's also, especially in light of what's happening, a really good time to be grateful and to be thankful for this, phenomenal sport and these 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 great horses and getting to see them go at it so i mean i'll be i'll be glued to the tv on saturday especially for the florida derby and you know whatever comes next it's going to be a hell of a horse race and and i'm pretty happy for that yeah and i think we, we would be remiss if we didn't mention that um there's actually another horse in the race um this jockey that was claimed uh for thirty five thousand dollars and and you know is there any synergy or, or, or commonality between another claimer from Gulfstream going up the ranks and running in some of these derby preps and then hopefully the derby, just like maximum security did last year. Um, it, you know, it, 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 it's interesting that you have a horse like that, that one first time out uh, ran a 33 buyer and then came back and ran 85 and 89 in, in a new barn. So it's just interesting the way things develop and, and, you know, do you make, um, you know, do you say that's the Gulfstream Park is the place to claim young horses? Well, I'm on the record picking tis the law. I'd like my two cohorts to give our audience around the world who they think will win the Florida Derby. Yeah, Bill, that's that's a great pick. You know, tis the law is tough to bet against in, in this race. But let me see if we can find, uh, you know, maybe one or, or two. Al Jaweed, I think, again, is a horse that sentimentally I would love to see do well. I think he might be up against it with some of these other horses, but he's bred to go long, and uh, this is certainly a nine-panel race that, that he should relish. Um, the horse right above him, Gouverneur Morris, is an improving horse. Um, came off a, a layoff from Keeneland to Tampa and, and tied the track record there. I think in Pletcher's hands, he uh, he is definitely a horse to, to watch out for. And then, I'd say in the end, on the outside, 
Um, will he repeat what he did last time? It's tough to do, um, but certainly uh, the horse has defied logic on a lot of levels, and uh, I would not bet against him in, in this race. So I'm going to give you that uh, that three horse uh, exact a box um, with the uh, with the five six twelve. I'm going to go. I'll take the three constitutions against the field. How about that? Like um, it. Like it. Uh, very nice. But uh, but you know, in seriousness, I think I think there's the law. You know, I I. As as good as authentic and the Baffert horse her horses have been, I think that Kids of the Lost Holy Bull is the most impressive uh, prep race run so far this year for three year olds, especially with the way Etta Indian came back to dominate the Fountain of Youth. The thing that the concern I have about Tiz the Law is that I think in his wins he's kind of had a perfect trip every time, and and as much as I love the Holy Bull, it was a really really nice trip that he had, and you know the one time he got into a little bit of a you know. He got in a little bit of a tussle or he got in a little bit of trouble was in the Kentucky Jockey Club when he got stuck along the inside and got that late split, ended up jumping back to his left lead and, and finishing third to horses that he's probably better than. Uh, so I would I would think that his trip is going to be you know really crucial here. I mean, everybody's trip, but I think especially his because he has had things his own way and his, he's had things easy in his wins. Um, and this is, you know, it's a big field. There's going to be a big crush of horses. I think on the outside of him rushing over the rail to try not to lose ground and going in that clubhouse turn. So he's got, he's got to stay out of trouble. I think he's, you know, pound for pound, the most talented horse in the race. And I wouldn't be shocked to see him win. Um, I think Gouverneur Morris is really interesting. I think, you know, he's a horse that might have benefited from you know, being put on the shelf after the breeder's futurity. I talked to Barry Irwin and he just, there wasn't a specific reason why he put him on the shelf. He just, he wasn't gaining weight and developing quite the way they wanted to. So they decided not to go to the breeder's cup and they gave him, you know, five months off or four months off. He came back with that really impressive win at Tampa. And I just, I like the way he has kind of made his own trip in these races. He, you know, stalked close to the pace in his debut and ran away. He was able to settle in the British futurity and did make a pretty good run, even though he got blown away by Maxfield in the end, you know, settled nicely and and rallied from off the pace in the Tampa race. I just think he's the kind of horse that in the middle of that group, in the middle of, of that field, could save ground and could get that good second flight trip. And Ajawit, honestly, I think is not impossible because I think there will be such a fast pace, but just in general, it's hard to make up a ton of ground on the Gulf Stream Park dirt. So I would like him better for, you know, maybe third or fourth than I would on top. So I'm going to take Governor Morris and then I'll, I'll put this the last second, Ajawit third. So the, the other question that I would have for you guys, since, since we're playing, yeah, you know, um, pick the brain game, um, is does the winner of the Florida Derby end up running in the Kentucky Derby? John, we have no idea. I mean, you yeah, know, I mean, if, if that, you're, that, that, yeah. what's, what's your opinion at this point? I mean, I don't know what, so what is the percentage of any horses that are racing in March still being healthy and, and racing and not on the sidelines in September? 50%? I don't know. Yeah, I, it, it's probably close to that, I would yeah. guess, yeah. So yeah. I'd, I'd say the 50% chance. You, you know, everybody's going to want to get there. I mean, if they had the Kentucky Derby on a Thursday in the middle of February, everybody would want to get there. But, you know, like, yeah, right. it's one of those things that makes this so weird is that, you know, we could read, it is the luck and win this by five lengths, and we'll pick up the TDN in, um, you know, the third week in May and read from Jack Knowlton that the horse has a so-and-so minor chip in his ankle or whatever, and we'll see him next year. I mean, that's just how the game works. Yeah, and it's just, I, 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 there's so much speculation now. I kind of, you know, I think a lot of us, for a lot of reasons, want to fast forward a month or two. But, you know, especially for this kind of stuff, you know, trying to see it out for the rest of the year and see how it's going to happen. It's just, there's there's so little to go on right now because this is such uncharted water, waters for horse racing and for, you know, American society at large. So I, I think it's, it's going to be better and it's going to be more satisfying when we have at least some kind of schedule for the rest of the racing year because right now I think everything's on the table but if I had to put a percentage on it I think about 50 is right you know the winner of the Florida Derby ends up in the Kentucky Derby but it's so much of it depends on, on what is left the rest of the year on the racing calendar that's going to do it for this week's episode of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland I want to thank Bill Finley and John Green. Uh, we're going to hope to have some a video component for next week's podcast. Um, so thank you for tuning in, and we will talk to you next week. 